may be unique in American history. The marches you see are not protesting unfair labor practices or advocating a political cause. They are here to challenge the conscience of the wealthy and powerful Watchtower Society, better known to the public as Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses have a massive international organization with millions of members and hundreds of millions of dollars. A gift that God gave to the human race, Amen, brother. Families and peace. But this deeply committed group is not likely to be intimidated. They have an urgent message to deliver. You can't see the hurt that we feel but we have, we have so much pain because so many of us are separated from our families because of the, of the Watchtower organization's rules. Unfair, unkind, unloving, unchristian rules. The organization sets itself up in the place of Christ. And that's something that the Bible does not teach. The reason we are here today is to attract attention to a genuine false prophet a genuine false prophet that Jesus warned us about. They have lied to us, they have deceived us, and we have the documented evidence. attracted me to the Watchtower Society was that they taught that Armageddon was so close that those uh, who were living now would never have to die but that they could live forever. I think one of the greatest uh, things that appeals to the people is that uh, we are taught, that we were taught that uh, we could live forever here on the earth and there would be peace, perfect peace among men and animals the little children could play with the animals and uh, there would be no harm or no hurt in all of the earth. Jehovah's Witnesses came along with a positive message, I thought, from the Bible. God had a plan and purpose for Martin Merriman and that is what I wanted, to please God. Martin Merriman was not alone on the Jehovah's Witness road. Statistics show that in the 22-year period between 1963 and 1985, the Jehovah's Witness organization grew from one million members to three million. Jehovah's Witness spokesman Eugene Mortensen. The increase that Jehovah's Witnesses are experiencing right now is phenomenal. Last year, for example, worldwide, we had a 6.8% increase. It all began in Pennsylvania in the late 1800s when Charles Taze Russell came under the influence of a second Adventist preacher. Russell initiated his own Bible study class, a small group that would ultimately grow to become the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Borrowing directly from the prophetic speculations of Nelson Barber, a New York Second Adventist, Russell claimed that in 1799, the world had entered the time of the end. That in 1874, Jesus Christ had returned invisibly and that the world would come to an end in the year 1914. In 1879, Russell, then 27 years of age, was so passionately convinced these prophetic dates were given by God that he sold his prosperous clothing business and struck out in a new direction. With very little education or theological background, he began printing the magazine Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Known today as the Watchtower, 
This publication, which has grown from an initial printing of 6,000 to well over 288 million copies annually, dictates all major doctrines to Jehovah's Witnesses. During his lifetime, Russell authored a vast amount of literature, including a series of volumes entitled Studies in the Scriptures. According to Russell, no one could understand the Bible without these books, and reading the Bible alone would lead only to spiritual darkness. One of Russell's teachings was that Egypt's Great Pyramid was designed and placed there by God as his second witness next to the Bible. It would be an instrument to reveal his great plan of the ages for mankind. This measurement indicates the length of the year, the weight of the earth, the distance to the sun, etc. Russell believed his dates and chronology were confirmed by the measurements of the interior passageways of the Great Pyramid. According to Russell, the passageways verified 1914 as the year the world would end. Finally, 1914 came and went. Russell and his followers were not raptured from the earth, and the end had not come. John Knight, who was 15 years old at the time, remembers what came next. Well, when 1914 came, of course, uh, we had to change our views, just like we had to change views later. The date was pushed forward to 1915, then 1918. Certainly Armageddon was just around the corner. But in 1916, Charles Taze Russell died, sick, weary, and disappointed. A massive stone pyramid stands today at his gravesite as an embarrassing reminder of his false prophecies. Through hard-fisted inside political manipulation, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, a Missouri lawyer who had given himself the title of judge, became the second president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in 1917. In 1918, Judge Rutherford's lecture, entitled, Millions Now Living Will Never Die, was the beginning of a worldwide recruiting effort called the Millions Campaign. Not too surprisingly, it proclaimed the coming destruction of the existing world. It would happen soon, in 1925. Based on the promises set forth in the divine word, we must reach the positive and indisputable conclusion that millions now living will never die. In 1920, the Millions Book was published. In it, Rutherford claimed the Bible proved that in 1925, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other faithful men of old were to be resurrected, to rule henceforth as princes on the new Paradise Earth. Fully convinced that Rutherford's prophecy was true, many witnesses sold their homes and businesses and took to the road. Living in cars and trucks like itinerant peddlers, they spread the warning. As 1925 drew closer, some farmers even refused to plant crops because they believed the end was at hand. Finally, 1925 came. And, as in 1914, nothing happened. Once again, the Watchtower Society's prophecy had proven false. As Russell had done, Rutherford doggedly held to the story that the end was just around the corner. In 1929, the judge had this palatial mansion constructed. It was deeded to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so they and other ancient worthies would have a place to live when they were resurrected. Located in an exclusive district of San Diego, it was given the name Beth Sarim, Hebrew for House of the Princes. The world entered the Great Depression, but Rutherford lived like a millionaire spending the winter months at Beth Serene, summering in Europe. 
As Americans suffered through poverty and deprivation, Rutherford enjoyed the use of two 16-cylinder Cadillacs. Under Rutherford, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society became a well-oiled corporation. New books, literature, and tracts poured forth in a flood to be sold door-to-door -door by faithful witnesses. He drove his followers to labor hard for the Lord. He advised young couples not to marry, but to put all their energies into proclaiming the kingdom. Even portable phonographs were utilized at the doorstep. Because the people have been induced to believe that Christianity and religion are the same thing. Around the world, zealous witnesses paraded in front of churches on Sunday mornings bearing placards with the slogan, Religion is a snare and a racket. Keeping up with the times, the society constructed its own radio station. And by 1933, there were 403 stations nationwide broadcasting Rutherford's abusive railings against the clergy, politicians, and what he referred to as the greedy commercialists. On the radio and in print, he continually stressed that the end of the world was just months away. The end finally came, but only for Rutherford. In 1942, he died at Beth Serene, the house he had built as a luxurious testimony to God's name. In retrospect, perhaps the only testimony this lovely mansion ever gave was to the cash value of false prophecy. In 1948, the society quietly sold the property, covering up an embarrassing chapter in its history. Today, most modern Jehovah's Witnesses are unaware that Beth Sarim ever existed. There is not one religious With Rutherford's passing, the flamboyant era of charismatic personalities passed as well. Today, Fueled by the anxieties of a nuclear age, the Watchtower Society is a multinational corporate giant, spreading its new message of doom to every corner of the globe. Standing between God and the millions of Jehovah's Witnesses is an autocratic ruling council called the Governing Body. Because Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Word of God is channeled to humanity through this elite committee alone, these men rule with unchallenged authority. Every witness is subject to their dictatorship, from the cradle to the grave. Raymond Franz, author of the book Crisis of Conscience, was a member of the Watchtower Society's governing body for nine of his 60 years as a Jehovah's Witness. His account of their secret sessions is revealing. I must say that it was one of the most disillusioning experiences of my life. Uh, it came as a a rude awakening to me to see what actually went on. I envisioned the governing body as a body of men to whom the, the Bible, God's Word, was the controlling force in every one of their decisions who really dug into the scriptures to make sure that everything that they did was soundly based upon the Bible. And when I got into the governing body, I found that the Bible was rarely appealed to, was rarely used, but mainly was a matter of discussing organizational policy and how to apply this organizational policy. And I found that again and again when issues came up, even though scriptures might be presented, if there was an organizational policy, that policy would take precedence over scripture. And I couldn't help but think of Jesus' words in Matthew 23 that they had made the word of God null and void because of their tradition. While the organization may not always consult scripture in determining policy, they never hesitate to cite scripture as proof of their authority. The Watchtower Society claims that it is the faithful and wise servant, or as Jehovah's Witnesses have translated it, the faithful and discreet slave spoken of in Matthew 24. Leonard and Marjorie Cretian are authors of the book Witnesses of Jehovah. For 22 years, they were loyal Jehovah's Witnesses. Leonard had risen to the position of elder and presiding overseer. The original belief was that Charles Taze Russell was the chosen slave. The Watchtower Society taught that the stewardship of the things of God 
had been taken away from the Christian churches and given to Russell. When Russell died, they had to adjust their belief to fit a new set of facts. Now they claim that in 1919, having invisibly come into power over the earth, Christ needed an organization to announce his kingdom and administer his affairs here. So the story goes, he carefully examined all the Christian religions and rejected them in favor of the Watchtower Society. Peter Gregerson was a member of the Watchtower Society for nearly 50 years. He was a highly respected elder and served in a number of responsible positions. And as a result, I started to do some very serious thinking about things that were going on inside the organization. It seemed to me, though, that everything always came back to the question, is the Watchtower Society and its leadership, are they the faithful slave? I really wanted to prove to myself that the Watchtower Society was right. Gregerson decided to examine the same teachings that Christ would have examined in 1919 when he was supposedly evaluating the world's religious organizations. The Watchtower's latest teachings at that time were published in a book called The Finished Mystery. What I found absolutely destroyed my confidence in the Watchtower. They had said that the end of the world would come in 1914. And in this book that was just hot off the presses for Christ to investigate, we're saying that by the spring of 1918, millions of people would be dying in the streets throughout the world. It, it wasn't happening in 1918. Christ was supposedly examining this written material to see whether the Watchtower Society should be put in charge of all of God's interests on the earth, and they were guilty of the worst kind of false prophecy. In addition to false prophecy, the Finnish mystery contained a number of other pretty ludicrous interpretations of Scripture. According to them, Revelation 12 clearly shows that Michael and his angels are the Pope of Rome and his bishops. Revelation 14 mentions the distance of 1,600 furlongs, which this fascinating book explains as the distance from Scranton, Pennsylvania to Watchtower headquarters in Brooklyn, provided you go by way of the Hoboken Ferry and the Lackawanna Railroad. The Bible speaks of the great sea monster Leviathan. You may want to know what the Leviathan really looked like. The finished mystery told Jehovah's Witnesses that the Leviathan was a steam locomotive and this little coupling link was its tongue. This book, the Watchtower's main teaching book of the time, included a prediction that in 1918, demons would invade the minds of the Christian church, which they refer to as the swine class. We wish every Jehovah's Witness today could read the finished mystery for themselves. They would probably reach the same conclusion Peter Gregerson did. I spent a lot of time praying, a lot of time thinking, came to the conclusion there was no possible way that Christ Jesus as a judge could have looked at this information and have given the authority that was claimed by the Watchtower Society. Still, Jehovah's Witnesses maintain that theirs is the only true religion. All others constitute the worldwide empire of false religion, the Whore of Babylon spoken of in the book of Revelation. The Watchtower says these religions are guilty of spiritual fornication with the political and commercial rulers of the world and will all be slaughtered by God at Armageddon. Only the true Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses, will survive. F. M. Geip, a Watchtower spokesman and member of the headquarters staff, explains. Well, we feel Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true religion, otherwise we would be teaching something else. But the reason is because we follow the Bible completely. To support its beliefs, the Watchtower organization has published its own version of the Bible, called the New World Translation. To lend credence to this translation, the Watchtower Society has deliberately misquoted a number of well-known Greek scholars. Dr. J. R. Manti, an eminent Greek scholar, was one of the authorities quoted out of context. The Watchtower Society has implied that he supports the New World Translation. Dr. Manti disagrees. I have never found any so-called translation that goes so far away from what the scripture actually teaches as these books published by Jehovah's Witnesses. They are so far away from what there is in the original Hebrew and the original Greek. Dr. Manti called the Jehovah's Witness Bible a shocking mistranslation, obsolete and incorrect. You can't follow theirs because it's biased 
and uh, it's deceptive because they deliberately changed words in the passage of scripture to make it fit into their doctrine. They distorted the scripture in many passages, scores and scores of passages in the New Testament, dealing with the deity of Christ especially. To find additional support for their altered scriptures, the Watchtower has even turned to the occult. The New Testament, a Bible translation by Johannes Grieber, has been used as an authority in many of their publications. Johannes Grieber was a spiritualist, heavily involved with the occult. His translation was completed under the direction of spirit messengers, with the aid of his wife, who was a self-professed spirit medium. The willingness of the Watchtower to accept any authority is reflected in the words of Charles Taze Russell in the July 1879 issue of Zion's Watchtower, where he stated, A truth presented by Satan himself is just as true as a truth stated by God. Accept truth wherever you find it, no matter what it contradicts. This philosophy is reflected in the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. When early Watchtower teachings that the world entered the so-called time of the end in 1799, that Jesus returned invisibly in 1874, and that the world would end in 1914 were proven false. Doctrine was conveniently readjusted. In the new version, 1914 became the date of both Christ's invisible return and the beginning of the time of the end. This date was put forth not as theory or interpretation, but as hard, indisputable fact. Watchtower Society official Eugene Mortensen. All witnesses from the study of the Bible have firm belief in the fact that since the fall of 1914, Jesus has come into kingdom power. And as he prophesied in the 24th chapter of Matthew, the generation that saw the beginning of this time would not pass away until all things would be accomplished. That means also the end of this wicked system of things. The Watchtower Society is very concerned that time is running out for the so-called generation of 1914. The few who are still living are quite elderly, and should they all pass away before Armageddon, Jehovah's Witnesses will be faced with another false prophecy to explain. Anticipating this future embarrassment, the Chairman's Committee of the Governing Body actually prepared a document suggesting the date be changed from 1914 to 1957. Raymond Franz was a member of the governing body when this recommendation was considered. Now, in this document, they suggest and advance as a, an idea that uh, the generation that would see the time of the, the uh, end of all things should not be counted from 1914. They fix on Jesus' statement that there would be signs in the heavens. And so they suggest here that the date should be moved up to 1957 when the Sputnik was sent into space by the Russians. And they say, now this is the celestial phenomena that would indicate the generation that would see the final wind-up. The Sputnik idea was ultimately rejected by the governing body. But for the generation of 1914, time is running out. How did the Watchtower arrive at 1914 as an all-important date? Their chronology is based on the year 607 BC, which they claim is the year Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Carl Olaf Johnson, Swedish author of the book The Gentile Times Reconsidered, is a former Jehovah's Witness elder and pioneer minister. I didn't question this chronology in the beginning because I thought the Bible supported it. I knew, of course, that uh, historians uh, dated the, the desolation of Jerusalem not in 607, but in 587 uh, or 586. But uh, in 1968, I conducted a Bible study with a man who wanted to know why historians. They uh, prefer the date 20 years later. Uh, so I started to investigate the matter. And I soon discovered that the historians had very strong evidence in their support. 
Johnson compiled his research and sent it to Watchtower headquarters. But the society's leaders were determined to keep their doctrinal system intact. I got the letter with a warning. I was warned that uh, I should not share my findings with uh, other witnesses. To conceal the facts and suppress his seven years of research, the Watchtower Society excommunicated Carl Olaf Johnson. Our teaching on Jesus Christ is that Jesus is the Son of God. He was the first thing that Jehovah created, and uh, through him other creative works were done. Now some religions teach that God and Jesus are one and the same, but the Bible does not teach that, and it, therefore neither do Jehovah's Witnesses. We believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus carries out a number of functions for Jehovah God the Most High. For example, in the Hebrew Scriptures, he is referred to as Michael. Uh, Michael, literally translated into English, means who is like God. Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is a spirit creature, a super angel, the first creation of Jehovah God, who prior to coming to earth as a man, existed in heaven as Michael the Archangel. Jesus started out originally as the Logos, Archangel. Who then came to earth as the virgin born son of Mary. He was a perfect, sinless man. But he was only a man, devoid of all divinity. Jesus walked the earth as a man, becoming the Christ only when he was baptized. Jehovah's Witnesses hold the cross in contempt, feeling that it is nothing more than a pagan symbol used by apostate Christendom. Instead, they teach that at the completion of his ministry, Jesus died, not on the cross, but on an upright stake. Christ's body was then laid in a tomb, where it was disintegrated by God, totally destroyed, forever. Jesus was then recreated by the Father. Before going to heaven, he materialized in different bodies on different occasions to convince his disciples and others that he had really been resurrected. Jesus returned to his Father in heaven, where once again he became Michael the Archangel. He will never again be seen on the earth in visible form, but instead rules invisibly from the heavens. When he executes judgment over the world at Armageddon, he will destroy all but the faithful Jehovah's Witnesses, 